let's get to know the band. Introduce yourself. Jerry Only, bass. Yeah. Yeah. Blim Whitman. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Doyle guitar. Yeah. Hello, fiends. My name is Hawk and Load, and I've got something to say. Quite a bit, actually. Today, I'm going to tell you the story of a band that, in my opinion, is not only a pillar of punk rock, but has its influence so deeply embedded into heavy metal that it's undeniable. The story of the Misfits is a revolving door of aggression, strife, and disillusion. But even through all of it, a timeless sound, look, and soul remains steady and unyielding. Glenn Danzig, Jerry Only, Doyle, Michael Graves, and the entire cast of others manage to harness imperfection and emotion in a way that is impossible to replicate. I'm going to give you the story as I've observed it in my thoughts and feelings. So strap in, because it's going to be a big one. Sit back and let Uncle Hawk tell you the crazy history of the Misfits. understand why I found it so fitting to include punk rock royalty among the early subjects of a series revolving around heavy metal, I need to explain to the uninitiated the rise of punk rock in the mid-1970s. While the connection and importance may be obvious to some, others may find it blasphemous, especially those who tend to hold genre boundaries in higher esteem than most. The term punk rock was a tool of early 70s rock critics to describe the 1960s garage rock bands. Bands like MC5 and Iggy and the Stooges, as well as the New York Dolls, existed outside of the established music industry structure and whose talent was in connecting emotionally to an angry youth more than simply making music. By the mid-70s, bands like the Ramones, Sex Pistols, and The Clash were what came to mind when evoking punk rock. Fast, simple riffs and rock and roll reminiscent of the 50s. They weren't necessarily the best musicians, but that was part of the charm and appeal. Punk rock is ultimately more of an attitude than it is a musical genre. A band like Motorhead, for example, fits all of the criteria for punk rock, but also ticks every box for heavy metal, but in the end, they were purely rock and roll. From its inception all the way to the present day, Punk rock has connected with a disenfranchised youth and energy. It is ultimately one of the founding father genres that saw the stratospheric rise of heavy metal in the 1980s. Bands like Metallica and the rest of thrash metal's godfathers would harness that shock and awe style, mix it with Motorhead and Black Sabbath, and take over the world. At the same time as the rise of punk rock through the 60s and 70s, the world saw a brand of hard rock music harnessing taboo subjects and over-the-top theatrical elements. It's known now as shock rock and does exactly what the name implies. It's heavy, hard rock music with things like satanic subject matter, horror and gore themes, and other anti-censorship elements. Artists like Alice Cooper and the aforementioned Iggy and the Stooges set out to offend and disgust their audience at times. It does seem like a you-had-to-be-there era of entertainment. With the internet demystifying and desensitizing all of us, it's hard to imagine Jimi Hendrix setting his guitar on fire as a shocking display of defiance. I could do an entire video on the history of these genres, and I likely will. Punk rock and shock rock have a lot of crossover, but I felt it important to give you a bit of a breakdown to get you into the right mindset. For myself and many others, Few bands employed these elements quite like Glenn Danzig and the Misfits did. So if you were there, let's reminisce. And if you weren't, like me, let's try and put it into our minds as we go through the story of a band destined to go down in the history books as one of the best, even if it didn't quite seem that way in the beginning. Oh. <laughs> 
A story about the Misfits, particularly their beginning and what they contributed to hard rock and heavy metal, is effectively a story about a New Jersey outcast named Glenn Danzig. With one of rock and roll's most unique and instantly recognizable voices, and an aggression that I'm fairly certain is just standard issue in New Jersey, he's an undeniable punk rock and heavy metal legend. However you feel personally about the man doesn't seem to matter to him so it really shouldn't matter to anyone. He is a love to hate and hate to love figure in the space, and he is responsible for some of the best music to come out of those genres. Born Glenn Allen Anzalone in Lodi, New Jersey in 1955, Glenn was the third of four sons. His father was a Marine Corps veteran of World War II and the Korean War, and after coming home, worked as a television repairman. Danzig's mother worked at a record store. While Glenn was only 10 years old, he began using drugs which led to him getting into fights as well as being arrested a few times. He was told that if he kept it up, he'd quote, be going away for a long goodbye, and by age 15, he'd given up his drug use. At an early age, Danzig was infatuated with bands like Black Sabbath, The Doors, and The Ramones. Glenn also had a love for horror writings and comic books, and even went on to make his own, quote, crazy, violent, erotic comics. Even in his early life, the foundation for what the Misfits would be was being laid. Glenn began his musical journey with piano and clarinet lessons. He later on taught himself how to play the guitar. At just 11 years old, he worked as a drum roadie and later into his teens began playing in garage bands, covering songs, and learning the ropes. Danzig was a naturally gifted vocalist and was entirely self-taught which is arguably his most defining characteristic. In his teenage years, he sang for many local bands in the New Jersey area, singing a mix of original songs and covering a lot of Black Sabbath tunes. From the retrospective lens, you can see all of the ingredients that go into the Misfits in Danzig's early life. He was gifted and ambitious, and he loved the music. The underground status of it all just makes it that much cooler, to me at least. And I think it factored into the freedom that his time in the Misfits afforded him musically. But we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit. In 1977, Glenn Danzig continued his musical journey with the inception of a new band, The Misfits. The band's name was taken from actress Marilyn Monroe's final film, and in the beginning was simply helmed by Danzig and drummer Manny Ramirez after their intended bassist no-showed, and original drummer Mr. Jim was replaced by Manny. Danzig wrote and practiced with Martinez in Manny's garage, and early work was done with simply an electric keyboard and drums. One of Manny's neighbors was dating one Jerry Kayafa, who had just received a bass guitar for Christmas. Even though Jerry could barely play the instrument, he was recruited to this newly formed Misfits. Jerry Kayafa was born on April 21st, 1955, also in Lodi, New Jersey. I found it tough to find any detailed early life information on Jerry. He was inspired by 1950s rock and roll and didn't believe he had the chops to learn the guitar, so he chugged forward as a bassist. Shortly after receiving his first bass guitar, he would be introduced to Glenn Danzig, and the two would go on to form the foundation of the Misfits. For three months, the band would rehearse sans a guitar player. Danzig would play the main melodies on his keyboard as well as provide vocals. The band even recorded a few demos. The band also played gigs, one of which was at the legendary CBGB's in New York City. In May of 1977, the band recorded their first single, Still Without a Guitarist, called Cough Cool. The single was released through Danzig's label, Blank Records. On the sleeve of the single, Jerry's last name, Kaiafa, was misspelled, and in frustration, he told them to credit him as Jerry, only Jerry. He would be known as Jerry only from that point to the present day. In August of 1977, the band finally recruited a guitarist when they brought in Franche Coma. Once the position was filled, Danzig dropped the piano and focused solely on his vocals. At this point, Danzig and only axed Martinez and brought in Mr. Jim to take over drums, Mr. Jim, the band's original drummer. Later on, Mercury Records wanted to use the name Blank Records for a subdivision 
However, Danzig owned the rights to the name. They offered the band 30 hours of studio time in exchange for the naming rights, and Danzig accepted the deal. In January of 1978, the Misfits entered the studio to record 17 tracks. Unable to find a label interested in releasing what would later become Static Age, they began to release the songs themselves under their new label, Plan 9 Records. The full album, as it was intended, would not be released in its entirety. That is, at least not quite yet. Proceeding forward after the Static Age studio sessions, Only and Danzig began to lean heavier into the inspiration from classic horror films. This was apparent with the naming of Plan 9 Records, and as he began to use these movies as lyrical inspiration, the misfits as we know them today began to take shape. The band began incorporating horror stylings in their stage attire as well, most notably with Jerry Only's signature face paint and devil lock hairstyle. Danzig and Jerry's brother Doyle, who we'll get to in a minute, would also adopt the hairstyle, making it almost as synonymous with the misfits as their logo. After a few lineup changes, the band would go on to release their horror business single, which featured the iconography from the film serial The Crimson Ghost, the first time the band had used it as branding on their music. From that point forward, the figure and its skull visage would become a mascot of sorts, silk screening it onto t-shirts for the band's fan club, affectionately known as the Fiend Club. By January of 1980, the band had just returned from a terrible stay in England. They had flown out there to open for the Damned, although a miscommunication between Damned singer Dave Vanian and Jerry Only meant that they had arrived there unexpectedly. They were allowed onto the tour for a couple of shows before quitting, citing it as a terrible experience. Once back stateside, issues arose with members of the band once again. Through most of the run-up to this point, Danzig and Only were the only consistent members, and turmoil seemed to plague the guitarist and drummer positions. Jerry's younger brother Doyle was a massive fan of his big brother's band and had even taken up playing guitar with help from Jerry and Glenn. When the band's guitarist no-showed a recording session, Doyle was brought in as a favored replacement at only 16 years old. Doyle would make his live debut with the Misfits at their annual Halloween performance at Irving Plaza in New York City in 1980. The recording sessions throughout the latter half of 1980 would later be released in April of 1981 as Three Hits From Hell. The track list included London Dungeon, which was written following Danzig's less than stellar experience being jailed in Brixton, Horror Hotel, and Ghoul's Night Out. Though the Misfits had recorded and released several singles and small records, they had yet to release a full-fledged album. By this stage, the legend and underground domination of the Misfits were fully realized, and with a massive catalog of great songs, they put together a set list of sorts. They had two full albums recorded, but never released. Though they originally intended to release Walk Among Us through their own Plan 9 records, they accepted a deal with Slash Records. One of the things, in my opinion, that makes Walk Among Us such a great listen is how sharpened and tested all the songs were well before being recorded. The band had pressed all of these songs tons of times before and played them live even more times than that. So by the time songs like Nike, A Go-Go, and Skulls made it to Walk Among Us, they were nearly perfected. Over the production cycle of this video, which I'll admit has taken a lot longer than it needed to, I haven't allowed myself to listen to anything else but Danzig era Misfits. And while I previously thought Walk Among Us was the absolute best these songs can be, I did find myself preferring other studio recordings of songs like Hate Breeders and even Brain Eaters. But it just lends itself to the magic of the era. There's so much to take in and I could listen to it all for the rest of my life and I likely will. Unfortunately for those of us who utilize services like Spotify, Walk Among Us is no longer available to stream or even buy digitally from what I can see, at least in the United States. I also couldn't find out exactly why. I believe it has something to do with the fact that Warner Brothers now controls distribution after acquiring Ruby Records. So if anyone knows for certain, Please, enlighten the class. In true Misfits fashion, many of the tracks were recorded throughout 1981 and early 1982. And with Danzig being the genius behind these songs, he sat in for the mixing. Walk Among Us was released in March of 1982 through Ruby Records and Slash Records. The Misfits had finally released a full-length studio album 
after five years of treading water and making a name for themselves as horror punk pioneers and underground legends. A national tour of the US in support of the album followed its release. It's here that we start to see things fall apart for the original run of one of punk rock's greatest acts, with members fighting often and getting into violent altercations. The tour saw Danzig getting into fights with drummer Googie, ultimately resulting in Danzig ousting him. He was replaced by Robo on recommendation from Black Flag's Henry Rollins. I love Henry Rollins. I cannot wait to make a Henry Rollins video. Anyway, the band was funded mainly by Doyle and Jerry's work in their father's machine shop. Danzig continued to run the Fiend Club and write music, but after a tour in the fall of 1982, Glenn was becoming increasingly dissatisfied with the Misfits. In the background, he was writing music for a new, separate project. In 1983, he told Henry Rollins that he intended to quit the band. The band recorded and released Earth AD in July of 1983. Danzig had decided to use two of the songs he had intended for his other projects, Death Comes Ripping and Blood Feast, giving the album the status of foreshadowing Glenn's hardcore punk and heavy metal direction. Earth AD was the second album released by the band and was a nine-track punk rock clinic, clocking in at a mere 14 minutes and 36 seconds. That was all the time it took, however, to melt your face. As I mentioned earlier, I've been on a bit of a Misfits binge, and Earth AD is such an underrated classic record. Every song is an absolute injection of energy. Hellhound, Queen Wasp, and even the title track. Not a single one of them fails to hype you up. So if you're perhaps a surface level Misfits fan, which is fine, I would suggest putting this album on repeat for a few days, and I think you'll get what I'm saying. As Halloween of 1983 drew closer, tensions only continued to rise. Robo had left the band and was replaced by drummer Brian Damage to play their annual Halloween show. It's show However, Damage got absolutely blitzed on stage and only made it through a few songs before Doyle escorted him off. Opening band The Necros lent drummer Todd Swalla to fill the rest of the evening, but it had been a disaster and the crescendo of turmoil had finally reached its peak. After returning to New Jersey, the band separated and the Misfits were no more. As much as I and many others would agree that Glenn Danzig was the lifeblood and genius of the original run of the Misfits, to discount Jerry and Doyle's contribution would be unacceptable. The energy, passion, and loyalty to the sound and the fans were certainly present in the Kaiafa brothers. Would the Misfits sound the same or have the same impact without them? I would argue no. The songs might be the same, and Danzig's signature voice would still be present, but I don't think it would have the same impact, even if I can't exactly tell you why I think that. As much as the Misfits failed to take fire in their heyday, what they did manage to do was infect and inspire a new wave of very important musicians. The legend of this era cemented exactly the right people to cement their legend. We had the same ideas. And so I did one more show at the Misfits, which was the final Misfits show in Detroit, because we always had a big crowd there. And a lot of um, people, you know, we just felt we owed it to them. We did one final show on Halloween in Detroit. And also, that's the night of Sam Hain, and that's when Sam Hain actually started that night. Okay? The Misfits hosted. Yeah, that's right. The night the Misfits actually were finally declared dead, we were born. Jerry and Doyle moved out to Vernon, New Jersey and began working for their father full time. The two would become fairly domesticated and even settle down and get serious about their Christian faith. With Danzig's evolving musical interests trending more towards heavy metal, he set out with a new band, Sam Hain, in 1983. Danzig would say in early interviews that Sam Hain started the night the Misfits were disbanded. He had been working on and writing songs for Sam Hain throughout a good portion of the Misfits' final stretch. <laughs> and yes, it's Sam Hain. It's pronounced phonetically. Even if Danzig was incorrect when he made the band, that's what he called it. Sawan, 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 I don't know, you're going to yell at me no matter how I say it, is a Gaelic festival. Sam Hain is the name of the band. Do with that information as you wish. With a new set of backing musicians, Sam Hain released their debut album, Initium, through Danzig's Plan 9 record label. 
Danzig's trajectory through the ranks of heavy metal was something special, but unsurprising. He's an immensely talented individual, but he'll let you know it, which led to some less than favorable stories about the man. In part due to Danzig's success through the remainder of the 80s and the rise of bands like Metallica, whose bassist Cliff Burton was a huge Misfits fan, even having the Crimson Ghost Visage tattooed on his shoulder, the band's status among the punk rock and heavy metal scene began to slowly elevate. When Metallica was looking to introduce their new bassist, Jason Newstead, following the tragic death of Cliff Burton in 1986, they released an EP of covers, and among them was Last Caress and Green Hell. With interest in the band at this elevated status, Danzig released a collection of unreleased Misfits tunes in 1985 and again in 1987. However, Danzig overdubbed much of the instrumentals to avoid paying his former Misfits bandmates any royalties for the sales. When Jerry reached out about precisely that, it kicked off a legal battle between the two that raged on until an out-of-court settlement in 1995. While Jerry conceded that Danzig wrote most of the music and all of the lyrics, he claimed that he and Doyle were responsible for at least 25-35% to 35 of the material. The settlement of the lawsuit allowed for Jerry and Doyle to record and perform as the Misfits, as well as a shared stake in the merchandising rights with Danzig. Later in 1995, a third compilation was released under these new terms, but Jerry and Doyle had a lot more ambition than just reliving the early 80s glory days. It was time for the Misfits to come back, and come back they did. Now, it's difficult for my entitled Millennial Throne to do justice to exactly how the zeitgeist around Danzig's solo projects and the rising popularity of the Misfits proceeded through the years after their breakup. And one of the coolest parts about my new professional headbanger position is having those that were there enlighten me and others about the era from the perspective of someone who actually lived through it. So if you're interested in letting me and other members of the Rock and Roll High School here know about the time, please hit up the comments. If you're mostly upset about the way that I'm talking, I suppose you could hit up the comments too, but I already know that it's making you angry, so your call, Jack. In 1995, immediately following the legal settlement with Danzig, Jerry and Doyle recruited drummer Dr. Chud, who worked with the brothers in their Christian rock outfit, Christ the Conqueror. No, I'm not joking. With a three-piece at the ready, Jerry and Doyle set out to resurrect the Misfits. The band released the Misfits Coffin box set in 1996, which was a dump of almost all of their Danzig era material, Sands Walk Among Us, and it remains one of the best ways to get into the band if you're looking for somewhere to start. As important as Jerry only was to the image, branding, and soul of the Misfits, pushing forward without Glenn Danzig at the helm was a bit of a risky move. But it was one that would pay off, laying down another era of horror punk greatness, and proved that Jerry and Doyle had the musical chops to carry the Fiend Club forward. All they needed was a vocalist. And it just seemed to me that it was something very valuable to, to the kids and to us. So we went out there and fought for it and got our name back and, and got it going. But we've always planned on bringing the Misfits back. It just took us a hell of a lot longer than we had anticipated. With Glenn Danzig refusing to return to the Misfits, having been in the middle of a very successful career with his band Danzig, Jerry Doyle and Chud held open auditions for a new vocalist. A young 19-year-old Michael Emmanuel had recently laid down demo tapes, hoping to land a gig as a vocalist in the industry. The owner of the recording studio where he recorded his demos knew of the Misfits' search for a vocalist and encouraged the young hopeful to audition for the job. Emmanuel was entirely unfamiliar with the Misfits at the time, and in preparation, binged the band's library on his Walkman, specifically Collection 1 and Walk Among Us, while on the job as a landscaper. Jerry was impressed with Emmanuel's ability and offered him the position, at which point he took the stage moniker, Michael Graves. Side note, this is where Doyle went from simply Doyle to Doyle Wolfgang von Frankenstein, because of course he did. At only 19, there was quite an age gap, but the band mentored the young singer and set forth to perform and write new music. Jerry felt that the core of the Misfits was old school rock and roll, and attributed their unique elements to why they lasted through their dormancy as popularity would have it. He put effort and grandiosity into the stage show, and the young Michael Graves was naturally gifted in that environment. 
He wanted to have the Misfits back for the fans, and with Graves at the ready, they did just that. The Resurrected Misfits released their return album, American Psycho, in 1997 and set off on a major international tour in support of it. They crafted music videos for the title track and Dig Up Her Bones and even appeared as characters in World Championship Wrestling or WCW backing up Vampiro. They were back in a big way. With writing credits being equally given to all four members of the band, American Psycho proved to the world not only that Jerry and Doyle had the musical chops to bring that classic misfit sound, but also that Michael Graves was a vocal powerhouse himself. Now, this is all my own subjective opinion, but American Psycho, and later Famous Monsters, features some of the best melodies that the band has ever produced, and at the very least, contends enough to spark debate among fans. The song simultaneously feels closer to 50s rock and roll and heavy metal than it does punk. That's just me, but I would die on the hill of Graves Era Misfits as metal as fuck. The bands that the Misfits inspired through the 80s and 90s had returned the favor, and it's great stuff. Now, what it does lack is the imperfect youthful aggression of the band's Danzig helmed works. And it's for that reason that Danzig Era Misfits will always reign supreme to myself and many others, despite the quality of Graves' contributions. Tensions between members of this incarnation of the Misfits seem to follow suit to their early 80s counterparts. In 1998, Graves took a hiatus of sorts and returned in 1999 to write and record their next studio album, Famous Monsters. Famous Monsters was released on October 5th, 1999. A music video for the single Scream was filmed and directed by famed horror director George A. Romero. It was another equally credited album and in my opinion was even better musically than American Psycho. The band continued to tour in support of the album. But as they did, tensions only increased between the members. Just over a year after the release of Famous Monsters, on October 25th, 2000, in true Misfits fashion, both Dr. Chud and Michael Graves walked off stage and quit the band. Doyle left shortly after to focus on a divorce and rehab his elbow. This would be the hard ending to this era of the Misfits, and there's not a whole lot to say about it. According to Graves, Tensions between Doyle and Chud were the major contributing factor to the crumbling of the resurrected misfits. A never-ending feud between fans of Danzig and Michael Graves era misfits rages even to this day. It's a sad state of affairs to me as I love them both and honestly enjoy them nearly as much as one another. I will say though, I tend to listen to them separately even as a huge fan and therein lies what I believe to be the issue. The two competing eras feel almost like two different bands with similar cores, but as it all falls under the Crimson Skull visage, it's going to cause squabbles within the fan base. But the parallels between the two eras are almost cinematic and much more alike than you may have thought. Um, no, I'm not going to talk about Michael Graves' political views for those of you waiting with bated breath. I'm here to talk about the music. While the story so far contains the two main eras, at least in the eyes of many, Jerry only did trudge on with the band beyond the departure of Graves, Doyle, and Chud. Recruiting Black Flag's Des Kadena and the Ramones' Marky Ramone only continued forward touring as the Misfits with himself on vocals. In 2003, they released Project 1950 through Only's Misfits Records, which was an album of covers of 1950s singles. While they've continued to tour off and on and have a revolving door of band members, there were releases here and there and nothing major happened for them. But in 2016, to the surprise of many, Glenn Danzig, Jerry Only, and Doyle announced that they would be performing together again for the first time in 33 years under the name The Original Misfits. Jerry Only told Rolling Stone magazine that it stemmed from a dispute that was leading to another legal battle, but ended up resulting in a reunion instead. Hey, we'll take it. Only also told Rolling Stone that he was hopeful that the original lineup would continue and perhaps even release new music together. They performed a set of shows in 2017 and 2018, but by 2019, 
Danzig was signaling that the reunion may be coming to an end. However, they've continued to pop up sporadically over the last few years, with the most recent shows being announced while I was writing this script, so I'm hopeful that I'll get a chance to see the magic eventually. I'm hopeful by this stage that anyone who is skeptical why my metal-headed series featured the Misfits, especially so early into it, understands where I'm coming from. The raw intensity of their original run has not only managed to stand the test of time, but continues to inspire generations of hard rock and heavy metal musicians all over the world. There was something so perfect about the way that I connected with the Misfits in my youth, and in turn, how it's connected me at an older age to that time. Music is subjective. How you feel about a band or artist has a lot to do with where you are in life at the time that you make the connection to them. How I feel about the Misfits is likely going to be a shared experience that crosses generations, but it's going to have subtle differences for each one of us. Glenn Danzig, Jerry Only, Doyle, Michael Graves, and the rest of the musicians that contributed to the Misfits legacy all wear a badge of honor that I'd hope they're proud of. This one goes out to all our fucking old crazy friends and all our, uh, all our new crazy friends. Cause, uh, I got something to say. And that, my friends, was the crazy history of one of punk rock and heavy metal's most important contributors. The Misfits continue to be a powerhouse among those who need them most, and The Fiend Club is alive and well. If you liked the video, like the video. If you hated the video, dislike the video, and maybe tell me why if you are so inclined. Subscribe for more of these awesome stories. I post shorts regularly if you don't want to wait for these bigger projects. Shout out to Pug, Reaper, and Jaden Ward for the Patreon support. You guys are the best. If you're looking to support the cause here, Patreon is a great way to do it. Or you can become a YouTube member, tell your friends, or follow on whatever social media you prefer. I am at Hockey Load on literally everything. If you liked this video, check out the Aussie years of Black Sabbath. Till next time, kids, remember to take care of each other and hug your pets tight.